Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 21, Judges. There always seems to be a catch involved with searching for the promised land. Either there's somebody already living there, like how the pilgrims had the Native Americans, and the Walking Dead survivors have weird paramilitary towns, or somebody is trying to prevent you from getting there, like the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. The only story I can think of where neither applies is The Land Before Time, where Littlefoot and friends do make it to the Promised Land and happily feast on tree stars. But he does lose his mom in the beginning, and it's really sad. So even here, there's a catch. But we're talking about the Israelites and their destination of Canaan, promised long ago by Yahweh to Abraham for his descendants, and they finally made it. Problem is, Canaan is already inhabited by, well, you know, Canaanites. Just like the Israelites, they're also Semitic, but they worship a whole pantheon of gods with spooky names like Moloch, Astaroth, Dagon, and Baal. Spooky because these gods end up being turned into demon princes of hell by the early Christians. Oh, that's another story. Canaanite is kind of a broad term to describe the various kingdoms and societies living in the region. To name a few, we've got Amorites, Moabites, Aramites, Jebusites, Hivites, and to the southwest is the Pentapolis of Philistia, the five cities of the Philistines, who will come up later in this episode. The Canaanites have a similar religion, language, and society, as well as one other thing in common. They've all been marked for death by Yahweh. As Moses told the Israelites in the last episode, God fulfilled his part of the bargain by opening the way to the promised land. But if they want to stay here and continue to earn his blessings, they have to clear out the current denizens. Sure, it's violent, but the new guy in charge, Joshua, is just the man to mete out his divine wrath. And the first target was the ancient walled city of Jericho. Way back when we mentioned it, Jericho was a thriving Neolithic trading destination. Nowadays, the city has seen better days, and its famed walls were not what they used to be. Still, a victory here would be a strong morale booster for the Israelites, and Joshua prepares his army for siege. Weakened as they are, those walls could still hold back the strongest of invaders, and without siege weapons, this battle could take months. However, it was all over in seven days. And it's all thanks to the secret weapon of the Israelites, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it didn't melt any faces with weird ghost angels. After six days of parading the Ark outside the perimeter of the city, the Levite priests assembled on the seventh day and sounded a thunderous blow from the shofar, the traditional ram's horn trumpet. In a shocking miracle, the walls of Jericho crumbled to the ground, and the Israelites stormed in, slaughtering the inhabitants and picking the place clean. I know it's just a story, but people have tried to explain where the Ark gets its power from, be it electromagnetism to radiation. Well, following this victory, Joshua next turns to the city of Ai, a greater challenge than Jericho to be sure. Ai's walls are sturdy, its army strong. This is going to need a cunning plan. First, a contingent of Joshua's best fighters would take up ambush positions close to the city and wait for the main army to march in. At this point, the king of Ai would hopefully sally forth and engage the Israelites outside the walls, which is what he did. Joshua leads the Israelites in a retreat, feigning panic as they flee for their lives. And eager to mow down his invaders, the king of Ai gives chase, totally unaware that Joshua's special forces have just infiltrated the undefended city and torched the place. The army of Ai sees the smoke and turns back to defend their home, which is when Joshua's troops drop the act and attack. Surrounded on both sides, the army of Ai is destroyed by the Israelites, its people butchered, the city demolished, its king hung from a tree. Heartless? Yeah. Effective? Absolutely. Joshua had succeeded in removing two enemy targets with no apparent losses, and had cemented the reputation of the Israelites as dangerous and merciless fighters. Of course, that could go two ways. On one hand, there will be plenty of armies eager for a worthy foe, but then again, there will also be those who would rather seek out a peaceful diplomatic end. Take the kingdom of Gibeon, for example. They decided it was wiser to seek peace with the Israelites and sent two ambassadors to meet with Joshua and plead for mercy, arguing that their non-Canaanite kingdom was farther away and therefore no threat to him. Joshua's on the fence. He's concerned about setting a precedent, but agrees to the treaty. 
It's only afterwards does he learn that the Gibeonites were in fact Canaanite, and their kingdom was much closer than they indicated. Joshua's outraged, but he's also worried about what you-know-who will say. After all, the orders were explicit. The Canaanites are to be annihilated, not negotiated with. That's pretty clear, although he did agree to that treaty, and going back on it would make him a liar. Oi, what to do? The response was twofold. The Gibeonites would be spared, thereby risking divine wrath, but they would not be treated well. As punishment for their deception, they would forever be the servants of Israel, the woodcutters, water carriers, and such. The Gibeonites begrudgingly accept these new terms. Joshua's fledgling nation had its first vassal state, and with it the problems and responsibilities that come. The powerful Amorite king of Jerusalem, Adoni Zedek, was displeased with Gibeon's easy capitulation to the Israelites. Punishment was in order to remind the other Canaanite cities who was the real power here, and he called for a coalition to destroy this wayward state. Four cities heeded his call, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. And so Joshua marched to Gibeon's defense, eager to redeem himself in the eyes of his god. Five Canaanite kings at once? That's a bargain. And as you'd expect, despite being grossly outnumbered, the Israelites trounce their enemies and execute their kings. What follows next is a campaign of blood and gore as Joshua continues marching throughout Canaan, conquering city after city and pretty much killing everyone he can. The citizens of Makeda, Libna, Hebron, Debir, they're all killed. And oh, even that race of giants I mentioned last time. The Anakim, who were said to be the progeny of some human-angel hybrid, are wiped out by Joshua and his bloodthirsty crew, although a few survivors do escape to Philistia. A descendant of this race would later engage a young Israelite shepherd in a legendary battle later on. But geez, enough with the bloodshed. This is getting ridiculous. Joshua seems to think so too, and finally proclaims the killing is over. They've cleared out enough of the locals so that the twelve tribes of Israel can divvy up the land for themselves. The mummy of Joseph was laid to rest, thus fulfilling an ancient promise, and Joshua at the age of 110 goes out like Moses does, with a speech. I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain, to be an inheritance for your tribes. Keep to the book of Moses, do not go against those nations that remain among you. Mention not their gods, nor swear by them, serve them, or bow to them. If you transgress against the covenant, you shall perish quickly from this good land which God has given unto you. Thus did the tribes of Israel claim the promised land and divide into their separate territories. But their work was far from over. Many Canaanite kingdoms still remained, and they were far stronger than anything previously encountered. Some of the tribes, like Judah and Simeon, embraced a militaristic attitude while others like Manasseh and Zebulon struggled against the Canaanites, thereby seeking out more peaceful tactics. They made treaties with their neighbors, and some citizens even started going native. Just like before, the men took Canaanite wives, converting to the Canaanite religion, offering to the Canaanite gods, especially Baal. In the absence of a strong leader like Joshua, and a unified single nation, the Israelites turned to their old habits. By now the question on many of your minds is, did this really happen? And if so, when? Well, those are two pretty good questions. As far as I've read, there's debate over it happening in either the 15th century or 13th century BC. The Israelites entering Canaan, that is. Archaeological evidence exists that some of those Canaanite cities mentioned suffered some kind of destruction around that 13th century mark. But tying this to Joshua's onslaught is speculative. There's also evidence of semi-nomadic people living in this area from the same time period, but their identity is also a mystery. Basically, those looking for cold hard evidence are gonna need to skip ahead two or three episodes, because while it's entirely possible we're dealing with historical events and people, there's also nothing concrete to work with. Just the written word and tradition. Aw, oh, but it's not like this is the first time we've done that, and it won't be the last. Hopefully we'll arm ourselves with as much truth as possible, but if it means traveling down some questionable historical roads, well, I think we'll be okay. Anyway, this is the time of Hebrew history where the tribes of Israel all operate semi-autonomously and without a centralized government, maybe between the 13th to 11th centuries BC. Instead of a king or ruler, there's a leader known as a judge. 
As you might expect, this person is not only responsible for hearing legal arguments, but also for interpreting religious messages and ensuring the continued success of the people. There's about 15 or 16 of them listed, depending on if you count Joshua as a judge, but for this episode, we're only going to take a look at two of them. When the Book of Judges starts, the Israelites have no one to blame but themselves for how rough things have become. Actually, all the stories in the Book of Judges follow the same pattern. Israelites do something that ticks off the big guy, and he storms off, which allows some enemy nation to wreak havoc. Israelites cry out for help, Yahweh relents and appoints a judge to save them. Judge overcomes whatever the current adversity is, and saves the Israelites, who promptly offer blessings and sacrifices and promise to be good and devout, and the cycle begins all over again as soon as they start acting like jerks. Says a lot about the human condition, right? Our first story starts with the tribes of Israel being naughty again, and without divine protection, are under assault by King Jabin of Hazor, a powerful Canaanite state. With a force of 900 chariots, they could easily trounce the Israelites, who for all their military might still relied on foot soldiers. No archers, no cavalry. They did, however, have a wise and capable judge, Deborah. Prophetess, musician, and the only female judge written about. She's famous for delivering her judgments from underneath a palm tree. And then there's the brawn to her brains, the mighty Barak. He's worried about the upcoming battle, but Deborah promised him victory over the armies of King Jabin. Yeah, except he's still not buying it, and insists she come with him. All right, she says, I'll go with you. But just for the record, God is going to deliver victory into the hands of a woman and not you. Yeah, well, whatever. The duo assembled their army of 10,000 soldiers and met the enemy on the battlefield. The Canaanites were led by an Assyrian named Sisera, who arranged his chariots to mow down the Israelites. And if everything had been normal that day, he would have. But fortune was not with him. A torrential rainstorm had appeared and turned the battlefield into a muddy mess. The sludge trapped the wheels of the chariots in place, and the Israelite army quickly moved in to strike. Shocked at this catastrophic failure, Sisera fled the battle, heading back to Hazor when he was flagged down by a Kenite woman named Yael. The Kenites were neither Canaanite nor Hebrew, but nomadic herders and skilled metal workers. Yael invited Sisera into her tent for shelter and gave him milk and a place to rest. Exhausted from his retreat, he thought nothing of lying down for the night, and Sisera groggily told her to tell no one he was here, and then fell asleep. At which point, Yael picked up a hammer and tent peg and drove the spike so hard into his temple he was pinned to the ground. Barak and his army eventually catch up to Yael's tent, where she showed off her handiwork. Deborah's prophecy had come true. The women were victorious. Deborah was the one who prayed for rain, and Yael assassinated the enemy general. Look, it's not often that women get to be heroes in the ancient world, so this is kind of a big deal. And to celebrate this achievement, Deborah composes a song, which ends up being called The Song of Deborah. Nice. Well, guess what? The good times didn't last. They've turned away again, and now the Israelites have to deal with their most powerful foe yet, the Philistines. No one's 100% sure where they originated from, but the best guess seems to link them to the Sea Peoples of the early 1200s BC, maybe even of Aegean Greek origin. They were part of the raiding parties causing so much trouble for the Egyptians, but have since been content carving out a little kingdom for themselves based around five cities on the coast, the most famous being Gaza. They've got iron, trading capabilities throughout the Mediterranean, and even the regional superpowers have trouble subduing them. They're bad news, and you'd need some kind of superman to stand up to them. Well, luckily for Israel, they had one. Samson. Miraculously born to infertile parents, they promised God that should he give them a son, that no razor shall ever touch his head. This hirsute hero would free the sons of Israel from the tyranny of all the Philistines. Except Samson only had his mind on conquering one, an unnamed woman from the Philistine city of Timnah. He's eventually told he's forbidden to see her anymore, but if you know anything about Samson, he doesn't take no for an answer. He stormed off to Timnah and found a lion stalking him on the road. Fueled with emotional angst, he lunges at the lion, ripping it apart with his bare hands. Ooh, even he's surprised at his strength, but continues on his way to be with his honey. And speaking of honey, when he returned to Timnah again, he noticed that a beehive had been built within the corpse of that lion. Hey, free honey's still honey, so he grabbed a few chunks of the honeycomb to bring back to his parents. 
Apparently, it must have been some good lion honey, because his parents agreed to come with him back to Timna, bless their union, and live it up at the wedding feast. And it was at this feast that Samson decided to have some fun with his Philistine guests. He proposes a wager. Answer a riddle he came up with in seven days, and fine linen shirts and robes are yours. Everyone loves a nice linen shirt, right? Well, the guests agreed, and Samson told his riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. I'm sure they all stood there with blank expressions. Riddles really aren't Samson's strong suit, but they at least humored him trying to solve it. Three days later, however, they were no closer to the answer, and now they were getting mad. Mr. Muscles over there thinks he's smarter than us. Now they confront Samson's bride-to-be, demanding she tell them the answer. She insists that she doesn't know, but they don't care. If she doesn't find out, they're going to set her and her father on fire. Jeez. Well, what choice did she have? I don't know why she just didn't tell Samson about this so he could go and beat them up, but instead she goes and gets the answer from him. Honey from a lion. Specifically that one lion. The seventh day arrived and Samson was told this answer. What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? To which Samson's cold response was, If ye had not plowed my heifer, ye would not found out my riddle. Which I think ye understand what he's saying here. Oof. Well, a deal's a deal, but the reward is not expected. Samson storms off to the nearby Philistine town of Ashkelon and kills 30 men, stripping them of their robes and shirts. Here's your stinking prize. I'm sure some baking soda will get those blood stains out. Afterwards, he kind of leaves town for a while. A few seasons, actually. It's now summer, and he showed up at his father-in-law's house demanding to see his bride. Except a little problem. He was gone so long that his father-in-law figured Samson was history and married off his daughter to another man. Uh Uh-oh. That's when Samson goes off the deep end. He caught 300 foxes and tied them all tail to tail, placing a torch between them. He lit the torch and sent the terrified animals loose through the local Philistine grain fields, destroying the entire crop. Their food supply demolished, and terrified of further acts, the Philistine farmers sought to appease Samson's anger by finally doing what was previously threatened. His ex-bride and father-in-law were burned alive. They figured that would make him happy, and instead he's like, No, Samson smash! He vowed not to rest until he had his vengeance, and after slaughtering the farmers, he ran off to make camp in a cave located in Judah. Now, you can't just murder an entire village and not expect retribution, and the Philistines send an army into Judah to go after him. These soldiers were seen as such a threat that 3,000 armed Judeans met before Samson to convince him to give up. Even after he talked about his treatment at their hands, the Judeans were not swayed, saying if he didn't turn himself in, they'd do it for him. Not wanting to see his countrymen injured, Samson allowed himself to be bound with rope and led to the Philistine camp. There, amidst the jeers and insults from the enemy soldiers, Samson flexed his mighty muscles and snapped the ropes apart. Grabbing the bleached jawbone of a donkey from the ground, Samson entered into a whirlwind of battle lust, killing scores and sending the rest fleeing into the hills. It's for this display of courage that he was made a judge of Israel for 20 years. And it's in that 20th year where a presumably hairier and stronger Samson was planning the attack on the Philistine capital of Gaza. This should hopefully end their power once and for all, yet still for all of his hatred of the Philistines, Samson still had a weakness for Philistine women. He again fell in love, this time her name being Delilah. The two even lived together, and one day when he was out she was visited by the local rulers who came bearing a bribe. 1,100 pieces of silver were hers if she could discover the secret to Samson's legendary strength. Straight asking probably wouldn't work here. He's learned his lesson before. Instead, Delilah tried to soften him up a bit with a little ego boosting, singing his praises while also wondering if there was anything that could actually stop him. Samson told her that if he were bound with seven green vines, he would be just as weak as any man. But believing she had the answer, Delilah quickly reported this and waited until Samson had fallen asleep, to which she bound him in those seven vines as he indicated, and then proclaimed, The Philistines are upon you! 
He sprung awake and, of course, easily tore through the vines. Delilah shrugged the whole thing off and pretended not to know where the vines came from, but persisted anyway in her efforts. Samson eventually tells her that it was really seven ropes that are his weakness, and when that didn't work, he said his hair should be fastened to a post, but again, no luck. Why he hadn't grown suspicious at this point, who knows. But her playful goading had now turned into full-fledged guilt-reverse psychology. He obviously doesn't love her enough to say the truth. Ay vey. Well, that got him. He spills the beans. If I be shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak like any other man. The secret was passed on to her handlers, and she received her silver and a soldier escort. That night, while Samson rested his head on her lap, she waved in those soldiers who quickly sheared off his hair and his beard. But was this it? Again, Delilah called out, The Philistines are upon you! And Samson awoke quickly, but was easily subdued by the men, who beat him down, tying him up with rope and gouging out his eyes. Placed in bronze shackles, he was led to Gaza and chained to work pushing a stone mill, pretty much like that scene in Conan the Barbarian. Blinded, alone, and abandoned, Samson pushed this wheel day and night, silently bearing his torture. As time passed, though, his hair slowly grew back, and with it, his strength. Soon the Philistines held a great festival in honor of their god Dagon, and it was decided that the best way to celebrate was to drag Samson into their temple so he could be properly humiliated. He was led there by a young soldier and placed between two pillars which he could rest on for support. His world might have been draped in darkness, but he could hear the thousands of men, women, and children mocking him. He could feel and smell the filth hurled at him, but what could he do? Nothing except pray for revenge, just one last act of vengeance. And so with every last ounce of strength, Samson pushed against those pillars as hard as he could until the stone cracked, causing a domino effect of demolition as the temple collapsed on everyone inside including Samson. His body is later recovered and given a proper burial, although as for Delilah's fate, nothing more is known. Samson's valiant sacrifice isn't the end of the Philistines, mind you, and they will retaliate in full force. The disparate tribes of Israel are really going to need an even stronger judge now, but look, this is a pretty vicious cycle of punishment and salvation. Nothing seems to stick, and honestly, what kind of policy is this to run a nation? Relying on superheroes who could be taken out by a barber? Where's the economic plan, the ingrained bureaucracy, the vision for the future? And you know what? The Israelites are starting to think the same thing as well. They want a new kind of leader, someone strong, captivating, someone with a lot of brains and a lot of chutzpah. Well, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you do, for better or for worse. And that's next time on the podcast history of our world. For more information on the music of the ancient Hebrews featured in this episode, visit ancientlyre.com. Special thanks to Michael Levy for allowing his authentic music to be featured in this episode. Please support his efforts to bring the sounds of the ancient world to modern audiences by purchasing his albums on iTunes, Amazon, or Bandcamp. <laughs>